Father, we just praise you this morning, for indeed you are our Father. And that is true for those who have trusted you and those who have trusted in your Son as Lord and Savior. So we thank you for all the great privileges that we have in Christ. We thank you that all of your promises are true and we can say amen because we know that they will come into fulfillment. We thank you not only for your son and for his death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you for the person of the Holy Spirit who indwells every true believer. And Lord, I do believe in the ministry of your Holy Spirit. I believe, Father, that you are sovereign. And I believe that Christ is exalted on high and his throne will never be shaken. And I believe that he is the soon coming king. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And now I pray that he would have the, the freedom to move into the hearts of people. And for those who need to be saved, we pray for their salvation. All of us need to hear your word. And so I pray that we would receive the word of God as the word of God and not as a word of man. May our minds be attentive, our ears willing to listen, and may our hearts be receptive. And may we leave here with a desire to obey the word of God and to share the word of God. May all the glory be yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to 1 Peter as we continue on with our sermon series entitled Sojourn. The title for this series comes from the main point of this epistle in 1 Peter. Peter is writing this in order to remind the Christians, both Jew and Gentile Christians, to remind them that this planet is not their home, but they are citizens of heaven. They are subjects to the king. They are part of his kingdom. Heaven is their home. The New Jerusalem is their home. However, while they're here on earth, Paul, Peter incur, uh, informed them that they would encounter trial and tribulation and they would encounter suffering, but they should not be surprised by it when it comes. Why? Because this is not their home. They are behind enemy lines and the enemy is seeking to do everything that he can do to destroy their testimony in Christ. He wants to keep them from being faithful witnesses of the gospel. So Peter's message to his hearers is the same as my message to you. I want to encourage you that this place is not your home. We are only pilgrims here. We are sojourners. We are passing through. We have a heavenly citizenship. Jesus is our king. We are subjects in his kingdom. The new Jerusalem is our home. So don't be surprised when you face trial and tribulation. Don't be surprised when you're persecuted or ostracized for professing the name of Christ. Don't be surprised when you feel like you're not welcomed here. You are behind enemy lines and the enemy wants to seek to do everything that he can to destroy your Christ Christian witness. He wants to destroy your testimony he wants to hinder you from being faithful to the gospel. And if your life does not match up with what you say you believe, your witness will be ineffective. And so with that being said, we come now to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking at two verses this morning. Only two verses. Look there at verse 11 of chapter 2. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. Abstain, he says. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. 
for they wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Andy Ford of Everett, Pennsylvania. I recently read a story about him in the Clarion paper. He was visiting in Alaska. He was on a fishing trip. And as he was on the dock fishing, he noticed two ladies walking alongside of the river there. He didn't think nothing about it. He began to cast his line into the water and immediately he began to hear a scream. Something happened, he didn't see what it was, but one of the ladies had fallen into the river. He saw her blonde hair just for a second and then she went under. A few seconds went by and he thought that she would not surface again, but when she did surface, she was screaming, help, I cannot swim. Andy looked around and he noticed that all the other fishermen were kind of dumbfounded. They were just standing there not knowing what to do. In Andy's report, he said that he heard a voice speaking in his inner man. And the inner voice said, throw her a line. He said he contemplated taking the weight and the hook off of his line, but he didn't. Apparently, he had like a 50-pound braided test line on his rod and he took the line and he threw it out there and he hooked the young lady and he was able to pull her to shore and save her life he went that day to catch fish but he ended up catching a person Jesus said to all those who follow him you remember what it was follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We all have that same responsibility. Speaking metaphorically, of course, there are people drowning all around us. All around us. Even in this auditorium, there are people drowning. People who are dying without Christ. And we have a responsibility to share the gospel with them, with the hopes of seeing them come to faith in Christ and thus being saved. That is the very thing that Peter is reminding his hearers of in this passage of Scripture. That's why the subtitle of this morning's message is Lifestyle, lifestyle Evangelism. Evangelism is not just something we're supposed to do once a year or once a month. Evangelism is to be a part of our everyday lives. We have been entrusted with the gospel. The Lord has commissioned us as ambassadors. Every single day when you wake up, you are to be on mission with the Lord. You are to be living a lifestyle of evangelism with the hopes of sharing the gospel and seeing people saved. When we look at this epistle, the discourse unit. Actually, we begin the body of Peter's message in verse 11. Um, chapter 2, verse 11, all the way through chapter 4, verse 11, is really the body of what Peter wants to share. Up to this point, he has been reminding them of their identity and their privileges. Like we studied last week, you're a chosen race, you're a royal priesthood, etc., etc. So he's been reminding them of their identity. He's been reminding them of their privileges. Now he's going to say, now this is what is expected of you. In other words, you think about all the wonderful things that God has done for you. All the blessings that you have in Christ. Think about your identity. Who were you before salvation? You were lost. I was lost. We were enemies of God. We were sinners. We were ungodly. 
We were living in rebellion. We were not worthy of Christ's death upon the cross, and we are not worthy of salvation. That's who we were before salvation. But now that we're saved, who are we? We are chosen. We are redeemed. We are forgiven. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are children of the King. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And as a result of these mercies, as a result of God's grace in our life, we now have a responsibility. And what is that responsibility? To abstain from fleshly passions which wage war against the soul. This is a call to holy living. That is the appropriate response to grace. The appropriate response to grace is to pursue holiness in every aspect of our life. So that you, that's what you're going to see Peter addressing here. Now before we actually dive into the text, I want to talk to you about some early obstacles the first century church had to face. Okay, Because sometimes we think, well, it was easier to do evangelism in, in this day. But it's hard today. We face so many obstacles today concerning evangelism. We just have it harder today than what they had then. Well, that's ludicrous. Everywhere Christians went in the first century, they were opposed. They were considered anti-social, atheistic, and depraved. Yes, they were considered atheistic. They were proclaiming a message of a criminal, according to the world standards, who was crucified. And they are now proclaiming him as the true king and as the long-awaited Messiah of the Jews. To the Greeks, this was ridiculous. I mean, after all, they were known for all their philosophical wisdom to think that a Messiah would be accused as a criminal and then die upon the cross, and you believe that he is a god? That is absolutely ridiculous. That's what the Greeks would have thought. Well, the Romans, they would have said, why would we worship someone who is so weak? Oh, they were proud of their strength, and they were proud of their military, and they, would, they saw Christ as weak and unable to rescue himself. They saw the ministry of Jesus as ineffective. What about the Jews? Just the thought of Christ being the Messiah as a whole made them sick at their stomachs. The Roman writer Suetonius said this about Christians. He says they are mischievous, and superstitious. Rome, they didn't mind you having your own religion. After all, the Jews had their own religion. But they did not consider Christianity a religion. They considered it a superstition. Tactius said, Christianity, and I quote, is a dangerous superstition. And Christians as a race are detested for their evil practices. What evil practices were these Christians, these early Christians being accused of? First, they were being accused of being atheist. Why? Because they would not worship all the false gods of Rome and they would not wor worship the false gods of Greek mythology. And so the Greeks and the Romans saw them as atheist and disloyal to the state because they would not worship the state religion and they would not bow to Caesar. In addition to being considered atheists, they were also considered to be cannibalistic. Cannibals! Because they often talked about feeding upon the body of Christ. Now we know that they were referring to the Lord's Supper. They were also accused of incest. Why? Because they met in secret 
And they often referred to the Lord's Supper as the love feast, and they referred to one another as brother and sister. They were considered to be people of hate instead of love. Why? Because they did not seek the peace of Rome. Because Rome believed that the gods were the one who blessed them with peace. So in order for the gods to give you peace, you must worship the gods and pay tribute to the gods. And because the Christians were unwilling, they were accused of hating Rome. They were also accused of secular practices and Lastly, they were accused of being blasphemous because they would not bow to Caesar. But Peter reminded them. He didn't list all those things. I shared those things with you. What Peter said was this, your greatest obstacle is within you. The greatest obstacle to the gospel is not the Jews or the Greeks or the Romans, and all the false things they say about you. The greatest obstacle to the gospel is your own fleshly passions. Therefore, abstain from them. We think about the obstacles in our day. Concerning morals, relativism. Relative Moralism. What does that mean? Do whatever you want as long as you believe it's okay. What's morally ethical for you may not be for me, but I don't have a right telling you, you what's true for you. Because what's true for you may not be true for me, but you have the freedom to believe what you want to believe. And so as we look, and listen, hear me now, because sometimes we always shift this. We shift this to the world. And it's true. Our world as a whole believes in relative moralism. Truth is relative. There's really no such thing as absolute truth. So just live like you want. You see this and many of the modern day headlines with the transgender issue and same-sex marriage. But the church is not exempt. You know what I've discovered in my journeys throughout Edmond, different places I go? I don't come right out and say, hey, I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church Edmond. I just get to know people. I don't tell them them who I am. And I will hear people say some of the most ungodliest things. I'm talking about curse words that an unsaved sailor wouldn't even use. Women using these type of words. Men using these type of words. And I hear this, and then I'll say, so where do you go to church? Oh, Oh, yeah, I go to church over here. So are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. Well, how, how does your language match up with your witness? Because the Bible tells me that what comes out of the mouth proves what's in the heart. And that's where some of you are today. You go to work and you get around your buddies and boy, you just let your tongue flap around in your mouth. And whatever wants to come out, you let come out. Listen, morals are not relative. Biblical morality is founded in the Word of God. And it is very important that we abstain from the flesh so that the world may see our witness and be drawn to the Christ we say we love. Concerning belief, Belief is pluralistic in our society. In other words, all roads lead to the same place. It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. We're all trying to get to the same place. So it doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Christian. 
all roads lead to the same place. And that is false. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. So yes, we do have obstacles in our day. Morality is considered relative. Belief is considered pluralistic. But listen, relativism, pluralism, postmodernism, Marxism, spiritual, uh, uh, new spirituality, Islam, communism, all these things, I can go on and on. These are not the greatest threats to our witness. The greatest threat to the effectiveness of our witness is not from without us. It's from within us. The greatest threat to your witness, the greatest threat to you being effective in sharing the gospel is you. And it's me. And there's not a person in here that God won't use if you make yourself available. There's not a person in here. God will use you as a means of shining the light in the midst of a dark world. Listen to me. God will use you as a means of bringing someone else to faith in Christ. But you've got to be a vessel that is willing to be used. That's why Paul told us in Romans, don't yield your body to the flesh anymore. But yield your body to God as what? Instruments of righteousness. God wants to use your body as an instrument of righteousness for his glory. So, we come now to our passage. We've already talked about it some and we look at it again. And he starts off by using a agapitos is the Greek word. And it's a... It sounds familiar to the word agape, right? Love, that sacrificial love. And so I believe that the best translation here is not dear friends, as some Bible translations say, but verse 11, the ESV says, beloved. He speaks to them as brothers and sisters. He speaks to them as the beloved, not only beloved by him, but beloved by Christ. And the reason that Peter uses that word is because he is seeking to gain an audience. He wants them to hear what he has to say. So it's like me saying to you, beloved, as your pastor, I love you, but more importantly, Christ loves you. And then the word beloved, then he says, I urge you, parakaleo. Does it sound familiar to the Greek word used for the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete? So Peter is saying, I Beloved, I am coming alongside you. I'm not standing at a distance and commanding you to do something that I'm not willing to do. Peter says, listen, I love you. I love you. And the reason I love you is because you are loved by Christ. You are beloved. I urge you, he says, literally, I'm coming alongside you. I'm in this with you. I need this message just as much as you need this message. And so my message to you is the same as your pastor. I'm saying, beloved, I'm coming alongside you. We're in this together. We all have this responsibility. And what's this responsibility? To abstain. To flee from, to abstain from what? The passions of the flesh. There's a negative and there's a positive. What's the negative? Abstain from the passions of the flesh. What's the positive? Keep your conduct honorable. Look at there. Here's the negative. Verse 11. I beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. That's the negative. What's the positive? Verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So notice what he says. As a Christian, living behind enemy lines, as a sojourner and as an exile, 
Those of you who are beloved by God, you are to abstain from the passions of the flesh. And you are to live your life honorable among the Gentiles. And when he uses the word Gentiles there, he's not referring necessarily to ethnicity. He's referring to the lost. So keep your, keep your witness honorable among the lost. Because God wants to see them saved. And he wants, you, he wants to use you. as a vessel to bring about their salvation. I don't know about you, but what a great privilege to think that God would use me to rescue the perishing from the pit of hell. That God would use Blake Gideon, just an old country boy, raised in southeastern Oklahoma on a farm with pigs and chickens and parents didn't make hardly any kind of money and we grew up poor. And that God would use me as a vessel to bring people into his kingdom, his majestic, glorious, undefiled, unending, eternal, glorious kingdom. That he would use me to rescue a life, to snatch a brand from the flame. There's nothing greater. There's no greater blessing. There's no greater privilege than to be used by God to save a soul. And I realize if I'm going to be used in that way, if I'm going to experience that type of blessing and that type of privilege, I must abstain just like you from my passions, my lust of the flesh. There's a couple of things we need to be aware of. So if you want to take notes, here's where you start taking the notes. Some of you are like, I already filled my page up. (laughs) Write it on your hand, your arm, whatever you have to do. What is it that we need to be aware of? And and what I'm going to address here, if we are going to abstain from the flesh, right? If we are going to abstain from the passions of the flesh, there are four things that we need to be aware of. And then there are four things we need to do. So first, I want to discuss the four things we need to be aware of. First thing, we need to be aware of sins present in us. In other words, where does sin live? Who does sin inhabit? Where does sin find its origin? What does he say? Abstain from the passions of what? Say it. Sarks in the Greek, English, flesh. Flesh. So we need to be aware of sin's presence in us. That's what he says. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. In other words, the old Adamic nature that's left inside of you. Yes, you're saved, if indeed you have trusted in Christ. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Yes, you're indwelt by His Spirit. Yes, you're forgiven. Yes, you're a new creation. But you still have a remnant of the old man living in you. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm I'm saved. I'm a child of the King. But I still battle with Blake. Anybody else? I still battle with my fleshly desires and my fleshly lust. And I will until Christ returns and I receive a glorified body or until I die. And so will you. Understand that you have a traitor that lives within you. You must be aware of sin's presence in you. 
Don't ever fall into the trap and saying, I would never. Can you believe what he did or what she did? I would never. You don't know what you would do. I can tell you this. You've heard me say it before. I don't trust Blake Gideon. I trust Christ who's in Blake. But I know what Blake can do without Jesus. I know what Blake can do and what Blake can't do when he tries to do it in his own strength and his own power. And quite frankly, it's ugly, it's messy, it's sinful. I realize that there is a sin nature that lives within me. It inhabits me. And if I'm not careful, it can be awakened and stirred at any moment. We have a joke at my house. Many of you remember the old, the old show. I haven't watched the new one, so I'm going way back when, okay? Black and white. You remember the old Bates Motel? Norman, psycho, right? I'll tell my kids when they get to arguing and bickering and they get to fighting, and you've already told them to stop it like 18 times. Anybody else? I say, I, here's what I tell them. I say, kids, you're about to wake Norman up. <laughs> yeah, Norman's asleep right now. But you're about to wake Norman up. What am I saying? You're stirring my flesh. I'm trying to be godly. I'm trying to be holy. But let me tell you. Every time I have to tell you stop, you're making it just a little bit harder. You're stirring. You're shaking my old sin nature. And it wants to rise up. Right? So be aware of sin's presence in you. Secondly, remember sin's pull towards you. Passions, he says. That's the pull of sin. Sin's presence in us. Sin's pull toward us. Sin is seeking to awaken our flesh through temptation and pulling us toward it. And at the same time, our flesh is pulling sin toward us. It's an imposter. Notice the word passions used. Because passions can be good. We all love joy and we like, we like to be happy and we like to be satisfied. And Jesus is the one who brings us joy. And Jesus is the one who brings us happiness. And Jesus, Jesus is the one who satisfies. But sin comes along as an imposter. And what does it do? I'll make you happy. I'll fulfill your desire. Oh, just indulge in me, and you'll have joy. Sin's pull, it's an imposter. Remember Eve in the garden, she saw that the fruit was a delight to make one wise, and what did she do? She took of the fruit and she ate, and she gave it to her husband, and he also ate. Remember Samson and Delilah? He lusted after her beauty. And it was his very lust, his passion for Delilah that resulted in his ruin. Eve's passion, Adam's passion, that resulted in their ruin. You remember what Satan said? Oh, eat of this and you will be like God. Also remember sin's persistence. It says wage war, sin's presence, flesh, sin's pull, passions, sin's persistence, wage war against the soul. It's not like you win a battle today and then tomorrow it's all over. No, 
the ultimate victory is ours in Christ, of course, but the battles against the flesh are every single day. And we must remember that sin is very persistent. The enemy is very persistent. He will bombard us with temptations. And as soon as we think we stand, the next thing you know, we fall. You can never let your guard down. You can never think that you've reached a place of spiritual maturity where you think you won't do something. So remember sin's presence in you. Remember sin's pull towards you. And remember sin's persistence against you. And by the way, he'll use all avenues. Your eyes. By what you watch. Well, I'm mature enough. I can watch this, but my kids can't. How naive. How stupid. I can listen to this, but they can't. I've got grace. So what if I say a cuss word every now and then? So what if I look at pornography every now and then? I'm not addicted to it. It's just something I do every so often. So what if I get drunk just once or twice a year? I mean, for the most part, I'm not doing it. So what does a little bit matter? It reminds me of the well-to-do man who was looking for a chauffeur, and he he interviewed three guys, and he asked the three gentlemen, he said, I want to ask you a very important question. How close would you drive to the edge without going over? One gentleman said, well, I could get about, I could get about, I'd get about five feet from the edge. The other guy said, oh, I could get within a foot of the edge. And then the third driver said, I won't even get close to the edge. And he said, you're hired. Isn't that the way we are sometimes? How close can I get to the edge? How close can I get to compromise? How close can I get to the edge, but yet not fall into sin? How much can I get away with? But what does the scripture say? It doesn't say, get close to the edge, but don't go over. It says, abstain. (laughs) Abstain from the edge. Abstain from the fleshly passions which wage war against your soul. Just recently on the news, there was a young lady visiting the Grand Canyon. And what did she do? She was taking a picture and she did what? Went over the edge and fell 400 foot to her death. Listen, friend, don't play around the edge. Don't look at things on your Twitter account and think it's no big deal. Follow people. What business do you have following people who are perverted? Oh, and listen, I don't have Facebook, but I'll creep. I'll creep on my wives. I'll creep on your Twitter, too. And I have seen some things, and I have found some things that if I were to tell you, you would blush and be ashamed of. Oh, I hope my pastor never finds out about that. But listen, the Lord already does know about it. He sees it. Some need to clean some things up. You say, Pastor, are you meddling? No, I'm trying to help. So, lastly, remember sin per- sin's purpose for us. What is sin's purpose? To dishonor our testimony. To dishonor our witness. So remember, sin's presence in us. Sin's pull toward us, sin's persistence against us, and sin's purpose for us. Or you could remember inhabitants, imposter, insistence, and its intent. 
So what is it that we should do? And I'll give you these briefly. First one, develop a God-centered consciousness. You have a conscious. You're always thinking about something. Develop a God-centered consciousness. It's about your attitude. What do I mean by that? Live your life every day knowing that God is watching you. God sees what you're doing. He knows what you say. He even knows what you think and what you're dwelling upon. So we have to ask ourselves, is God pleased with this conversation? Is God pleased with what I'm looking at? Is God pleased with what I'm doing? Many of you have asked me, you say, Pastor, why do you have a green ring? Well, for practical purposes, I don't have to take it off when I'm doing the exercises I like to do. Secondly, it's green because it reminds me of two things, go and grow. Go, take the gospel to the lost. Grow in my relationship with Christ and in my marriage. Go and grow. It's a tangible symbol to remind me of a spiritual truth. Perhaps you could find something just as easy as that to help you to remember to have a God consciousness. Listen to Christian music. Read your Bibles every day. And if it'll help to put a bumper sticker on your car saying, I love Jesus, to make you drive right, then do it. But if it doesn't help you drive right, listen, take it off. Some of the things you can do to increase your God consciousness is to reflect. Reflect on God. Reflect on His Word. Rejoice. How about, how about give God thanks daily for things? So rejoice. Give God thanks. Reflect. Rest. Spend time with the Lord in His presence every single day. And resolve. Resolve that you obey the Lord no matter what. You want a God consciousness? Rejoice daily, reflect daily, rest daily in His presence, and resolve daily to obey His will. And when you fail, repent immediately. So develop a God consciousness. Number two, dress with His armor. Dress with God's armor. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us to put on the whole armor of God. The belt of truth, study the word. The breastplate of righteousness, obey the word. The shoes shod with the readiness of the gospel, share the word. The helmet of salvation, meditate upon the word. The shield of faith, believe the word. And this is all put on by way of prayer. So listen, you need to have the right attitude, a God consciousness. And you need to have the right armor, God's armor. Thirdly, daily seek God's presence. That's abide. A da daily abide in the Lord, abide in God's presence, abide in God's promises, abide in God's word, abide in God's church. Abide. That's why so many young people, when they go off to college, they get confused by their Marxist professors or their socialist professors, their agnostic or their atheist professors. Why? It's not because these men or women have the corner on the market concerning truth. It's because those who are going off to college are not abiding. If you will abide in God's word, abide in God's presence, if you will abide in God's church, if you will put on God's armor, and if you'll develop an attitude that is focused upon God, you'll find yourself standing firm in the face of aggression. And then lastly, declare God's victory. Agree with God that you've already got victory over sin. You've often heard me say, stop battling for victory and start battling from victory because you already have it. The Lord has given you the power over death, hell, and the grave. That's the reason that Paul said, reckon yourselves as dead to the flesh and yield your bodies no more as instruments of unrighteousness but instruments of righteousness. So reckon, reckon that Christ has given you the victory. Consider, consider yourself as dead to sin. And thirdly, yield, yield your body to God as an instrument of righteousness. I gave you the first things that you need to be aware of. You need to be aware, you need to be aware of sin's inhabitants. 
Sin's imposter. Sin's insistence. Sin's intent. What should you do to war against sin? You should have the right attitude. You should put on the right armor. You should abide in God's word. And you should agree with God that you already have the victory through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Spiritual warfare is a reality, and I love what D.L. Moody said. He says, I have more trouble with D.L. than I do any other person. I have more trouble with Blake than I do any other person. So many times we spend time pointing the finger and judging and all these things, and what we need to realize is that you've got more, you've got more to deal with with yourself. So look at what he says. Why is all this important? Keep your conduct among, verse 12, keep your, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, because they're going to, when they speak against you, in other words, what he's saying is they're going to speak against you. Don't give them a reason to. They're going to do it, but don't you give them a reason. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. So that on the day of visitation, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. What does this day of visitation refer to? Well, commentators have two ideas. Some believe that the day of visitation is referring to the second coming of Christ. When one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. I don't believe that's what he's referring to. I believe that he's referring to the promise of salvation for the lost. I believe that God is promising that he is going to come to the lost and he is going to save them. And he is saying this. When I visit them, those people you work with, I'm going to visit them one day. Those people you work out with at the gym, I'm going to visit them one day. Your family members and your neighbors, your friends, your teammates, your employees, I'm going to visit them one day. So abstain from the flesh so that when I visit them, they'll see your good deeds and glorify God. What's God saying? I'm going to visit them and I'm going to use your witness to do it. Because I want them to see your good deeds. I want them to see your good deeds. I had this one lady at my church, and I'll say this and I'm going to be done. Her husband was lost. Lost. She'd been praying for his salvation forever. But she was the groppiest woman I ever met in my life. And she would go home after church, and she would just vomit. Bad attitude all over her husband. Well, yeah, that, he'll, he, that's going to get him saved. Yeah, I'm, that'll work, I'm sure. That's, that, that is crazy, isn't it? So many of you want to see people saved. You pray for people's salvation. But what do they see in you? My prayer is that they will see your good deeds on the day of visitation and that God will use your witness as a means of bringing them to faith in Christ. So I conclude. I'm not a soccer player, but I do know this. On a soccer team, you have a goalie who guards a goal. And those goalies, they'll say things like this. This is my zone. This is my box. This is my house. And I'm not going to let anybody into my house I'm going to take care of my zone you have a zone God has put people in your life you are a person of influence and God is saying to you and to me take care of your zone for the glory of God Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for your word this morning. 
So much more could have been said, of course, but the point has gotten across. And what a needed message in our day. I know I need it. And so, Lord, my prayer this morning is for those who need to be saved. For those who have never truly trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For those who have never truly confessed with their mouth that he is Lord. For those who have never truly believed in their heart that God has raised him from the dead. For those who have never truly surrendered their life to Christ. And because of that, they don't know where they're going to go when they die. Some have been trying to convince themselves there's something they're really not. They're going through the motions, but there's no reality. Others would profess that I've, I've been putting it off. But Lord, I pray this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would save their soul. And I pray that they would respond. I also pray for those who desire to be a faithful witness. That God, not only would they come to the altar and pray for those who are lost, but I pray that they would say, Lord, use me. Would you be so bold as to do that, congregation? Not, don't only, not only do I want you to call someone out, call someone out out by name who's lost from the altar. I want you to ask God to use you. Help. Ask God to help your testimony to be pure and holy in His sight. Here in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And for those of you who need to be saved, we'll have ministers down front. Would you please walk up to one of them? And by coming, you're saying, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. I need to be saved. Others of you, you just want to find a place at the altar and pray for that prodigal child or that prodigal spouse. Or perhaps you need to come and repent because you've been compromising. And instead of being a faithful witness, you've been unfaithful. Listen, God will separate your sin as far as the east is from the west. God will cleanse you. God doesn't want you living in guilt and shame. That's not of the Lord. He wants you to walk in joy and peace. He wants to use you. You say, God would never use me. You don't know what I've done. Listen, God will use you. You quit listening to the enemy. God will use you. God wants to use you. You just got to be willing to say, Lord, here am I. Use me. And so perhaps some of you want to come and say that to the Lord this morning. Father in heaven, we give this time to you for your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand now and begin to come as the Lord leads?